Making sure. Okay. All right. So I come at this with a slightly different perspective because I'm actually trained as a biologist, and so I look at open-endedness a little differently. But I look at it all through essentially the realm of evolution and a particular subset of things in evolution. Now, as uh, I also always start with. Oh, that did not move forward, even though it did there. I like to start with acknowledgments because we always run out of room at the end. Uh, so obviously, uh, co-authors on the list are vitally important. Funding sources is why I'm here. Uh, and a couple of collaborators who aren't actually uh, co-authors on this particular project. So as I don't really have to convince people in this room, evolution is a substrate neutral process. And so we can have actual evolution despite working with non-living systems, and we don't have to get into arguments about whether our computer systems are alive. Um, they simply require a few basic traits. We need there to be variation in the population. Not all of these fish are identical to all of the other fish in this coral reef. Um, some of that variation needs to be heritable. These puppies are more like their parents on a number of features than they are like randomly other selected dogs. Some of that variation has to lead to differences in survival or reproduction. So there has to be some form of selection. And as long as you have these three features, over time, evolution by natural selection is an inevitable consequence. Now this is going to be true regardless of whether we're working with an actual living system. Um, so. Some of my work in the past has really been focused on living systems, which are great. We have this whole amazing diversity of evolved forms, but they're all from an N of one. Um, and it's hard for us to make certain generalizations about evolutionary patterns when we don't know how much of what we're seeing is all due to a shared ancestry and a shared evolutionary history among all of the different things we see on the Earth. And so the general concept in experimental evolution is we would like to clone the Earth. But it turns out that's difficult, um, and most of us don't have the funding to actually set up replicate Earths and run a full evolutionary sequence. So in the biological community, we tend to rely on experimental conditions where we can treat uh, different flasks of microbes as their own separate worlds that have been evolving independently. Uh, so my work in my PhD was all in this particular biology system. Uh, this is the long-term evolution experiment from Rich Linsky's lab. It's a long, ongoing project that's been going on for a little over 30 years now. We have about 67,000 generations of bacteria that have been evolving in this very simplified system, um, and 12 replicate populations that have not been in any genetic contact with each other for a very, very long period of time. And the portion of my work on that that's relevant to this and actually leads into the experiments I'm going to be talking about from my paper today deal with plotting out how fitness changes over very long periods of time. Now, because of some discussions earlier on in this conference, I realized that it's actually important to talk about what we mean by fitness in this particular sense. Um, fitness has a couple of different meanings, somewhat different from different fields. Uh, the standard in evolutionary computation is often a difference from an optimal solution. And so fitness is something you're trying to minimize. There is some global optimum towards a particular problem, and you're trying to reduce the difference from that. From an evolutionary biology perspective, fitness is a very different thing. It's some sort of measure of reproductive capacity of individuals, most often as a relative measure compared to others in the population. This different conception of fitness can lead to very different mindsets. And actually, uh, Wolfgang Bonsoff and I are working on a review paper about these different fitness concepts and the implications that they have. But in the work that I'm talking about today, we're coming at it much more from the biological realm, where we're measuring fitness as the reproductive capabilities of individuals within the population and how that changes at a population level over evolutionary time. And so, Getting at this, in uh, our biological system, we found that uh, our power law here, which is a nice unbounded function, does a much better job of predicting fitness over long periods of time than do asymptotic functions. So details that you don't care about, I could go into, but fundamentally we have two different models here. Fit on the first 40% of our data. We can project what we think that would mean over longer periods of time. We can then overlay the actual data, and you can see that the blue curve is actually 
much, much better than the red curve at this. So these bounded models often do a good job of describing current data, but they do a terrible job about predicting future data. And therefore, they're not actually a good description of what's going on in the system. And so we wanted to see how general this phenomenon is. So we started looking at this in a computational system instead. Now, as you probably figured out from my list of co-authors, this computational system that we're looking at is in Avida. So for those of you unfamiliar with it, Avida is one of these uh, digital evolution software platforms. Organisms here, this is a picture from the educational version of it, not the research version that we don't actually graph out all these pictures, so things will run in reasonable lengths of time. Um, each one of these colored boxes here is its own self-replicating computer program. This replication occurs not perfectly. The user gets to define a mutation rate, and that introduces a source of variation in the population. Because they're self-replicating, this variation is heritable, and because there is competition always for space in the world and also for computational resources, organisms that get certain mutations are going to experience selection for those phenotypes. And so therefore we have a source of selection, so evolution by natural selection is an inevitable outcome in this system. Um, and our fitness measurement here is all a metric of essentially their CPU cycles they obtain per unit time, divide it by the number of CPU cycles required to replicate themselves. So it becomes essentially a measurement of reproductive capacity over a given length of time. So it's much more of a biological definition of fitness than it is an evolutionary computation definition of fitness. So actual experiment that I'm talking about today. Uh, so we decided to try looking at this uh, as a very simplistic one, looking at one relatively complicated environment. So the Logic 77 environment deals with all of the non-redundant 1, 2, and 3 input Boolean logic functions. Organisms are given 32-bit long numbers. They need to perform bitwise logic operations on them. If they correctly output the answer to one of the logical tasks, they're rewarded in their fitness. In this particular system, uh, their fitness is doubled every time they manage to output a correct answer. And that is regardless of the complexity of the task. They are allowed to perform each one of these tasks up to 10 times. Uh, we did this in part so that we knew that saturation of being able to do literally everything in the population seemed relatively unlikely. Uh, the fact that we allow them to perform it 10 times leads to interesting complications. Um, we did this as a two-phase experiment. In phase one, we started with a basal ancestor capable of self-reproduction and nothing else, um, and let it run for 200,000 generations, uh, and we had 10 different replicates of this evolution. And then from each one of those, we took the final organism that was numerically dominant in the population and started 10 new runs from that organism. So we have 100 runs in the second phase, whereas we only have 10 in the first phase. We used the data from the first run to talk about what our expectations would be over much longer time periods and use the data from the second set of runs to test those predictions. So fundamentally, we can see that in this first phase, there's a lot of impact of the individual evolutionary history of different populations. You can see that this is a log two fitness axis. So some of these ones up here are somewhere around 65, some of the ones down here are around 40. This is a tremendous difference in their reproductive capacity in these different populations. Um, and you can see that we have this general trend that things are going up and then they seem to be leveling out. Turns out that uh, probably due to the fact that my background is in biology where data is difficult to obtain, uh, I also have decent grounding in statistics so I can tell you that these things are in fact better fit by this bounded model than they are by an unbounded model, at least from our initial predictions. So each replicate is individually better fit by this bounded model. And these high fitness replicates drastically exceed the theoretical expectations from the low fitness replicates. But interestingly enough, we know that there is a viable mutational path from any organism in any of these different runs to any of the other organisms, because each one of them are descended from the same ancestor. And so there is a set of mutational steps that lead through non-zero fitness organisms, organisms that are capable of surviving and reproducing, albeit some of them would do much worse compared to the final descendants that they eventually give rise to. 
So it's not really reasonable for us to state that it's impossible to get to these higher fitness levels, even though our asymptote says you will never be able to reach them. We then go on and actually look at the second phase. And here I've done a slight rescaling. So each one of these colors is a different one of those initial replicates. They're all set down here so relative to their fitness at the end of the first run. Now, because this is a log scaling, the relative growth from each one of these is the same. This is not actually introducing problems. I, I've had to explain that to a number of people. Log properties are occasionally non-intuitive to people who don't often log transform their data. Um, but you can see here that some of these things end up exceeding wildly what the end of their first phase was. Some of them have relatively small changes, and although most things stay relatively close to what their ancestor is for the second phase, we get individual replicates from a wide variety of the different ancestors radically exceeding the fitness that we would predict from the early ones. These fundamentally fall into a couple of different categories, but first, if we look at the general summary, we've got here our different seeds, what our predicted asymptote is, and what our final uh, fitness that we observed was. And we can see that in five of the different 10 cases, we have individuals that end up exceeding that theoretical asymptote. Now, that theoretical asymptote is based on infinite time. This is the amount that we expect fitness to reach if they were allowed to run past entropic heat depth of the universe. We didn't let them run anywhere near that long. We only let them run for an additional 200,000 generations, which while that seems relatively long, it's nothing compared to evolutionary history out in the wild. Um, so we've only essentially doubled the x-axis, and we've already got half of the populations providing individual examples that exceed our theoretical asymptote and by relatively substantial margins. We have this one here, for instance, where a theoretical asymptote is about 48 and a half, and we have individuals that are up at 73, and since this is all on a log scale, this is a tremendous difference. These things come, as I said, in a couple of different categories. We have some cases here where even our bounded model over predicts what long-term fitness will be. Each one of these gray lines here shows the actual evolutionary paths of our different replicates. So there's one line up to this point, and then suddenly there are 10. Um, the red line here is our bounded model prediction, and the blue line is our unbounded. So we do have examples where even our bounded model is over uh, predicting what's going to happen. We have other cases where the bounded model does a good job of predicting what happens to the average of everything that comes out of the data that fit it but it actually ends up under-predicting about half of them and over-predicting the other half of them. We have other cases where even the unbounded model radically under-predicts what's going to happen. This case is one where you can see we had this rapid rise in fitness early and then a very long period of nearly stasis. And then as it turns out, a couple of the replicates began drastically increasing very shortly after this next phase. So this is a case where our historical contingency matters substantially. If we had been running this replica and stopped the initial run here instead of here, we would have had a vastly different prediction of what was going to happen. By chance, it turns out it happened just after that phase, and so that changes things drastically. And we have other cases where it seems like individual replicates either end up roughly where the, the unbounded model is, or they end up roughly where the bounded model is. And we have almost nothing in between them or to a far extreme of either one of them. So we have these very different cases. But fundamentally, what this paper is demonstrating is that just because something appears to be bounded doesn't mean that it actually is. We have these cases where it seems like there's a of flatlining. We actually have stats to show that a model that expects that things will flatline will outperform ones that allow for continual improvement. Um, but just because we have that expectation doesn't mean it's actually true. We have about 17% of our cases ended up overperforming uh, what their theoretical asymptote would be, and that's only after doubling the x-axis. If we went out further, that number would, if anything, increase. It has to be a monotonically increasing percentage. Um, and 
This is dependent in large part on the actual environment. So these large but rare gains in fitness end up drastically shaping what our predicted patterns are because the small improvements that are still around and are happening relatively frequently can be masked when fitting the overall statistical pattern. When we've looked at environments where there are much smaller changes available, for instance, environments where we don't actually reward them for any of the computational tasks, they simply have to get more efficient at basal replication, we end up with virtually every single one of them being better fit by the unbounded model than the bounded model. So the environment in which you are looking at things determines strongly whether you're going to see things flatlining or not. Um, and the appearance of uh, these, this appearance depends so heavily on the environment that it's actually difficult to make broad scale claims about whether evolved patterns are bounded or not because it depends so much on how you're choosing to evaluate them. Um, so extensions that we've either completed since we submitted this work or in the process of working on, um, so we're looking at environments with lower rewards and we're looking at populations switching between environments. So populations that evolve in a more complex environment and then move to a radically simplified environment are more direct comparisons to what we've done in biological experiments in the past. We wanted to see if that's going to actually increase the degree of consistency of our results. Other than that, I am done a few minutes early and I have plenty of time for questions. If we can replicate what we did this morning, so if, if you've got a question, if you could come up to the front here, and then, um, oh, you've got, we actually have a microphone and someone to roam around with it, brilliant. Um, so raise your hand if you've got a question. Thanks, so um, one of the things with this plateau that I've seen in a previous case is that adding HGT actually changes whether or not you have uh, a strong kind of Poisson discovery of things, or whether you have something that looks smoother, more like the unbounded curve. Have you looked at anything like that? Uh, yes, actually we have. So there is no horizontal transfer in this case. There's actually also no horizontal transfer available in the bacterial case that we're looking at. Um, but work with uh, Rosangela Camino Koning, who's a former PhD student of Charles who's just recently graduated, we have introduced horizontal gene transfer into this system. And we've been looking primarily about how it impacts evolvability and modularity. And so it does increase evolvability. Modularity, it still depends exactly on how we choose to measure it, and so we're still in the process of hammering that out. Um, but there is a strong impact on that that does actually depend heavily on the environment. So we've been looking at these things in changing environments and the differences between benign and harsh changes, which is basically, do you switch from whether something is rewarded to whether that thing is neutral versus do you switch from whether something's rewarded to whether that thing is punished, that has an impact. And it also depends on whether these changes are cyclic versus whether these changes are stochastic. Um, and so we actually have a couple of papers out on that and another one in review at the moment. Thanks. <clears throat> So I think what you see is that, I mean, we have a system where the events of making these steps, right, they are also somehow powered or distributed, right? So it might take a very long time until you get the next type of step, right? And that's why your fitting or even even the approach to, say, if you want a mean fitness at some point is really sort of ill-defined because the there is no mean of an algebraic distribution, right? It's just infinite. So, so, and so even the statistics of your runs at a certain time is very complicated to define because it takes them potentially very long time steps to get the next jump. So even if you wait longer, there's still a possibility to one of them to just jump up to some higher level. So There is always the possibility of a large jump uh, happening much further on. If you zoom in on any one of these, you'll actually see that these, what appear to be smooth curves, are actually just the abstraction of a whole bunch of stepwise functions. And the reason why this thing looks like a curve for the set of populations as a whole is because each one of these steps, on average, compared to the previous step, it takes longer for that next step to occur, uh, largely due to issues of it being, on average, a smaller reward than the previous step had been. And so that influences sweep time dynamics uh, because there is competition within this population of different lineages that have different beneficial uh, mutations 
compared to the currently dominant thing competing with each other and therefore slowing down the rate of any one of them fixing. So you have more and more steps that are themselves shorter and take longer to finish, which smooths out to this sort of power law curve is what we can predict about populations as a whole. But being able to predict what happens on the whole does not allow us to predict every individual instance. There's so much contingency in the particular mutations that happen along one particular trajectory that we can make predictions about what is likely to happen on average from things that have experienced its past history, but we can't predict in X number of generations it will have increased by Y amount exactly. Uh, this is pretty much what I, what I wanted to say, that the, since the time between the events of an increase are by themselves power or distributed, you have hard time to make any prediction because that's true when you're looking just at the large impact ones that you can see at this particular scale. Mm -hmm. That isn't true when you zoom in and you can see the much larger number of smaller effect mutations. Because these large effects that you're seeing are largely driven by gaining new traits of the ability to do logical tasks that, weren't being, that the population was not doing beforehand. But there are also smaller increases available, so things that increase the replication efficiency, things like changing how the copy loop is working or uh, modifying the number of instructions required to produce something. So those, if you zoom in at a smaller scale, are themselves step functions. They're just much smaller effect sizes. So the, the inability to predict, though, I think is exactly the same point there. I mean, it, it mm -hmm. does. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Yes, just here. I vaguely remember something from a statistics course long ago about a method for knowing when to stop sampling from a distribution to achieve a certain probability of accuracy. So maybe the lesson of, of what you've presented here is that we shouldn't be trying to fit curves the, the usual way. Maybe we should be looking at a kind of model that tells us when we can stop running our simulation or whatever. I think that actually is a potentially valid point, depending on what your goals for doing this fitting are. So if you're trying to use this to predict when your algorithm will have reached a certain percentage of correct answer or within a certain distance of the global optimum, I would absolutely agree with you. I'm viewing this from a much more biological perspective of trying to get a sense of how fitness changes in an evolving system. And so this allows me to go to much higher replication rates and uh, levels and much greater evolutionary depth than is possible within a physical wet lab system. And it also lets me test whether we've properly abstracted certain principles because we're not operating on the same black box of cellular biology in the system as we are in the wet lab. We are only implementing certain uh, conceptual frameworks and certain selective pressures that we think are important, and we're seeing if that can still produce the same large impact, which shows that those particular set of features are sufficient to explain the pattern that we're seeing. And so it depends entirely on the sort of question you're asking, whether this is an appropriate approach. Okay, uh, could we have the next speaker up, please? We just need you to switch over. Uh, which does give us time for one bonus question. Uh, so if anyone has one final, final question. Yeah, up at the back. Could you switch in? Hi, I was just uh, curious about um, what your intended message is to this community about uh, what we can draw from openness from this sort of result. Is it something like... So, yeah, the pitches plateaus can be deceptive, or something more deep than that? So that is part of it. I do feel that uh, there is strong advantage to more concretely defining what it is you're looking for, and then approaching it in a statistical framework to see if you've actually found uh, things that are exceeding your expectations of ending or not. Um, I feel that there has been a substantial amount of work in computer science looking at the ideas of open-endedness done entirely based on visual inspection and with almost no formal testing of hypotheses. And I feel that there's a lot to be gained from taking a more statistical approach to things and more exactly defining what your predictions are and then setting them up to be tested. Thank you very much.